thanks for joining me to talk about enzyme pathways. These are also sometimes called biochemical pathways because we're doing a lot of biochemistry here to within the different enzymes. So this is the first example of an enzyme pathway I'd like us to look at. You can see there's many steps to this pathway. We're starting with the initial substrate, farnesyl diphosphate, and the final product all the way over here is zeaxanthin. Farnesyl diphosphate is actually uncolored. It's an uncolored molecule, whereas zeaxanthin is a colored molecule. And you can see down here that many of our fruits and vegetables are colored by these products of this enzyme pathway. Now, farnesyl diphosphate is modified by the enzyme CRTE to produce geranyl geranyl diphosphate, which can then be itself modified into phytoene by the help of CRTB, and phytoene can be converted into lycopene by CRTI. Lycopene itself is actually a colored product, and this is what's present in tomatoes and watermelon to give them their beautiful red color. Lycopene can be converted into beta carotene by CRTY, and beta carotene is what colors, for example, carrots or squashes to be an orange color. And then the last step in this pathway could be the conversion of beta carotene to zeaxanthin by the CRTZ enzyme. And zeaxanthin, of course, is what gives corn its yellow color. So you can see that there are five different enzymes whose job it is to help produce this final colored product. But perhaps not all fruits and vegetables have all of the enzymes. For example, tomatoes might not have any activity of CRTY, and then here, lycopene would be the final product. But in carrots, we've got lots of CRTY activity, so we end up producing beta carotene, but not any CRTZ activity so that the carrots don't turn yellow. So this is a single example of an enzyme pathway. I'd like for us to look at another example of an enzyme pathway or a biochemical pathway. Here we have the production of the product isoleucine, which is an amino acid, from the starting substrate, threonine, also an amino acid. And you can see it takes one, two, three, four, five enzymes, or five biochemical reactions to produce isoleucine from threonine. So each of these enzymes is gonna have a very specific job. It's going to be reducing the activation energy of one reaction. So we're really doing five different reactions to get from threonine to isoleucine. And then each of the intermediates here might not be important for the cell. They're not gonna be amino acids themselves, but they are important to help get us, again, from threonine to isoleucine. Now, if we zoom in on this pathway a little bit, you can see that isoleucine here can act as an allosteric inhibitor of enzyme one. So when there's sufficient isoleucine that has been produced by this pathway, it can come back and act on enzyme one so that now threonine won't be able to be turned into the intermediate A. Since isoleucine is, a, is an end product of this pathway, we actually call this feedback inhibition. So it's not just allosteric inhibition, it's allosteric feedback inhibition. Isoleucine is feeding back on the activity of enzyme one. So this is negative regulation of this pathway, feedback inhibition. If there were another part of this pathway, maybe there would be other enzymes that could turn isoleucine into other things, um, but isoleucine can then be both a product or going forward, it would be our substrate. And for that matter down here, it can be an inhibitor. Um, not to mention the fact that it's gonna be part of proteins. So in this case, isoleucine plays many different roles depending on what type of protein it might be interacting with. Many different roles for this one end product. And that's because biochemical pathways 
can be pretty complex. We've just drawn them here as, as a straight line going from point A to point B, uh, but we're going to talk about some pathways, or rather some cycles, um, that move more circularly or that could be branched and have many different possible final products.